So we were talking about the progression in the life of grace from hard times at the beginning when you have to really work hard uh, to eventual habituation to the, the godly life and progressively a sense of taking pleasure in it. Joy in doing good is not the norm, especially at the beginning. Reason and faith and the fear of the consequences of acting differently are more usual motivations. And so because of the two goals, uh, of the, the two aspects of experience, the sin pressing in on us and our hope of glory, we have a change in our experience. And it's this changeableness which is a major source of pain and confusion. It unsettles one's projection about one's future and constantly subjects to question one's settled beliefs about identity who I am. I define myself in one way this year, by this time next year, I look at what I've written and it seems unlikely, untrue, unrealizable. One cannot believe that life without God can be pleasurable or even tolerable since one has been exposed to the attractiveness of God and one is never able to quite forget that experience. On the other hand, the kind of life demanded by fidelity to grace can appear to be stark and ungratifying. Especially at this early stage we have to work, swink and sweat, as the author of The Cloud of Unknown says. We have to work hard and perspire. We have to really uh, labour to overcome our tendencies, to identify them, to see what their roots are, to see what their effects are, and to try and neutralise them in our daily life. And that's not interesting sort of life. It's relatively interesting to fly to a monastery. And, and the change of life and the different clothes and the different rhythm of life is relatively interesting. But after the first year, from say the second year Navishad on, then the grind starts. Uh, that we are faced constantly with our own uh, weaknesses and our own uh, difficulties and we'd like to escape them. And some of us are very good at escaping them. Some people escape them all the way to middle age and, um, and then eventually catch up with them. But we really have constantly to work uh, on uh, exposing our, our seams of weakness and doing something about them. It's far beyond his present skills and habits and he has to strain to achieve even the semblance of it. He is way out of his depth and so he often fails and falls and sometimes it does not seem worthwhile trying to get up again. So this is ordinary experience. And now, one of the great sources for this doctrine, which we're going to concentrate on, especially in this section, is SC, Supakantika number 17. In, SC, in Supakantika 17, Bernard clearly states that the test is not whether he fails or falls, because certainly he will, seven times daily. I think this is where the real magic of Bernard's uh, wisdom comes through. He says, understand this, the question is not whether you make a mess of your life or not, because eventually you will, and in one sense the sooner the better, because the more pliable and athletic you are, the more possibility you are of accepting a solution. But, you know, until your monastic life is a, is a mess, you're still in the minor league. And so he says it's not a question of whether you get your life in a mess or not, but how you handle it when you do. I don't know if any of you read the book of Hermann Hesse, Journey to the East. And it's, it's exactly the same idea there. The test, he said to Brother Leo, uh, is not you know, whether you fail in the test, but what you do when you have failed in the test. <laughs> because the test was such that everybody had to fail in order to see how you cope with failure. And it's exactly the same in monastic life. It's so designed to, to, to lead you into a glorious failure. And uh, it's only when you succeed in making a failure of your life that 
uh, you, you're in a position to know what sort of uh, monastic person you are. Right? Uh, the test is not whether he falls, because he clearly will, seven times daily. The test is what response he makes to such setbacks. Does he become desperate because he relies on his own efforts and energies, or does he cede his autonomy and look to God for help and support? So if he cedes his autonomy and looks to God for help or support, he passes into a kind of passive or receptive mode of life in which he's willing to receive from outside, from God, from the community, from other persons. Uh, but if he stays in the active mode, he's trying to do it himself. He's trying to get those faults under control, to get those vices out, uh, to get those virtues in, and working hard. And all right, you know, I've made a mistake, but I'll work harder and work harder until I burst, which eventually he does. Um, but the solution is not to work harder, the solution is to go into a receptive mode, a passive mode, uh, in which we allow ourselves to be acted upon by God. The test is one to which human beings are subjected by God's deliberate design. This is the way spiritual progress works. For a while we have a time of activity, but then necessarily the time comes for us to pass into the more challenging uh, sphere of receptivity. It's not accidental to spiritual progress, a distraction on the way. It is the ultimate test of faith, whether I'm prepared to accept from God, whether I'm prepared to need God, whether I'm prepared to acknowledge that without God my life is a mess. The alternation of effect, affects and experiences is due to the working out of the divine plan for progress. Some change is caused by the intrinsic weakness of fleshed humanity, a fragility of body and a frailty of will. I mean, sometimes we just get tired, we just get hungry. Have you ever practiced contemplative prayer or tried to when you're hungry? All you can think about is food. <laughs> and um, it dominates the consciousness. And uh, uh, so that our body is frail. It, it stands out and punches us on the nose if we don't pay attention to it. So our body is, is frail and our will is likewise frail. And if we try and deny that and pretend that we're somehow different, that I'm not like the rest of persons, that I'm, I'm somebody for whom progress is linear, I just keep chuffing ahead uh, day after day, then I'll certainly come, uh, come to uh, a fall. Then there is a seasonal variation. These are some of the themes we'll find in Bernard. The, th the theme of seasons is very good. I don't know what it's like if you make fruitcakes, but if you live on a farm, you do different things at different seasons. And you can't say, well, today we're not doing anything else, so we'll go out and cut some hay. Or you can't cut hay in, in the winter, normally, except in Ireland, which they seem to cut at all seasons of the year. But, um, uh, it, you know, there are certain things. Bernard talks about pruning it. Sometimes if you, if you, if you prune the plant, then, then you'll, you'll, you'll destroy its fruitfulness right, instead of helping it. And you've got to know the right time to act, and that different seasons in life demand different responses. Sometimes I've got to get up and, and work hard, and other times I've got to sit down and sleep. And to, you know, the greatest wisdom is just this ability to know what is demanded of me today. Not yesterday, not last year, not when I was a novice, but what, what's needed now. And many of us don't get very far simply because we keep doing the same old thing that we always did and hoping to make progress, but in fact we don't because the, the demand is, call, is, is different now. Seasonal variation. A time appropriate for one thing may not be appropriate for another. At some stages in our life we'll have to read a lot, perhaps not pray all that much. At other stages perhaps we may not need to read very much, but we do need to spend a lot of time in quiet prayer. Sometimes we'll need a lot of solitude, other times we'll need a lot of community. And so it's important that we, with the, with the help of somebody who will give us honest feedback, uh, be able to discern what is required for us within the range of variations. Sometimes matters must be allowed to reach crisis point before being dealt with. Sometimes other factors have to be developed first, which will aid eventual resolution. I remember once we got a death notice from Ross Cray, which is our mother house, and my abbot said, 
Oh dear, poor father so-and-so. He said he was, he was a great little man really, but he never had a crisis in his life. Meaning he never got anywhere in monastic life. <laughs> because he never had a crisis. Because a crisis is a God-given gift which shakes us out of our complacency and uh, allows us to, to have a different perspective on life and to start moving in a different direction. Without that, that crisis, we just simply keep on, on in, uh, doing the same sort of things in first gear uh, until death catches us. And if you read uh, some of Bultmann's writings on, 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 on the early chapters in John, and, and the, the crisis sections in chapter 3, chapter 5, you'll know how he develops this. That the coming of Christ brings crisis. Uh, the advent of Christ in the scene puts everybody on the spot so they have to make a decision. And so that we can develop this idea that whenever we find ourselves in crisis, whenever we find ourselves confronted by a decision, there is really one fundamental thing happening. We're being presented with a new apparition of Christ, as it were, and asked to make a decision. It's not the way we expected it to be, but it's a new advent of Christ. And we're asked either to assent to that or to keep on doing the things that we used to do. And the, the bottom line of crisis is that it's the possibility of a, of a new uh, relationship and so forth. The intrinsic changeableness of Christian experience of grace means that no single experience can be isolated as normative of human response to God. So, all right, we take, for example, joy, and we preach a wonderful sermon on joy. Brothers, God is joy, and where there is joy, there is God, and so forth. And joy is the most infallible sign of the presence of God. Uh, Leon Blois said that, I believe. I've got a card from Jean Leclerc with that on it. But, but um, all this kind of thing. And then, so we say, the only thing in the Christian life is joy. All right? Fine. But we've made joy into a normative experience. Joy is fine when, when joy is called for but there are other aspects of human life. We make suffering normative and say, what are you doing being happy? I'll soon change that, you know. Whenever I come into the room, I'll change it. Um, so no single experience is normative, but we have to, if we're healthy people, then we respond to the flux of events according to where we are uh, at any, any time. The intrinsic changeableness of Christian experience of grace means that no single experience can be isolated as normative of human response to God, nor any particular mode of behaviour specified as universally expressive of such response. It's the danger of having a rule, um, and especially a rule which is inflexible, because it locks us into a level of response which may not uh, always express where we need to be at a certain time, uh, the way that we need to act at a certain time. And um, although it can be very useful at the beginning, at la later stages in life it can be counterproductive in some senses without going too far with this one. There is flexibility both in experience and obligation which calls for sustained sensitivity on the part of the Christian and a determined detachment from expectations and projections and a willingness to be transcended. Yesterday, what you were yesterday was pretty disastrous. At least it is, if you keep, keep that way today. You've got to keep going beyond what you were yesterday. Keep moving. Huh? All right, that's, that's the end of the homilies. Uh, now we start looking at some texts, which you say exactly the same thing in a little bit more diffuse manner. So one of the great um, problems of... of general spiritual experience and, and so forth, which Bernard confronts, especially when he's treating of the Song of Songs, is the dialectic of presence and absence. The dialectic of presence and absence is an important theme of the Song of Songs, as in any love affair. Familiarity breeds contempt. Uh, people look better at a distance, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> Uh, not a very nice compliment, but um, that uh, presence and absence is, is, is the whole uh, way that, 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 that uh, a relationship develops. Bernard uses this as a starting point for one of his most sustained reflections on the theme of alternation. 
the Holy Spirit acts on the soul not only during his perceived presences, but also when he is experienced as absent. Now, in other words, to say, when we find that God is absent, then we are not abandoned by God. <laughs> All that we are experiencing is the effect of God's grace, which is making us fully aware of the extent to which sin has caused us to be separated from God. But this is God's work as well. So it's not strictly speaking an absence of God, but it's our experience of the fact that we have withdrawn from God. And it's God who's making us experience it. Let's just see the way he, ex he expresses this. So this is where he says we're going into some advanced doctrine now. Do you think that having penetrated so far into God's holy place and having examined something of that wondrous mystery, we might dare to go still further and investigate realities which are deeper. For this spirit has access not only to the heart and bowels of men, but also to the very depths of God. Hence we are also always safe when we follow him both to our own hearts and to the higher realities above us. One thing, however, is necessary. We must keep guard over our hearts and over our understandings, lest we think him present when he is not, and so go away, uh, go astray through following our own instincts instead of his. This kind of stage. If we're at this stage when the spirit, so to speak, is substantially absent from our life, and we say, oh, we've got the Holy Spirit, so that every thought that comes into my, my head is God's inspiration. Every plan that I conceive is already uh, the will of God. Because I think it's good, then God thinks it's good. Alleluia, even in Lent. And, um, you know, this kind of optimistic identification. Y you sort of say, well, God has somehow taken over me, so whatever I think has comes from God. And Bernard says, uh-uh, it's a bit dangerous, huh? Lest we think him present when he is not, and so go astray through following our own instincts instead of his. For the Spirit comes and goes as he wills. And nobody knows readily where he comes from or where he goes to. Latin translation of John 3, Spirit blows where he wills. You know, that, that's what he's talking about. Nobody knows readily where he comes from or where he goes to. Now, it's possible not to know where he comes and goes without endangering our salvation. But to be ignorant of when he comes and goes is clearly very dangerous. The Spirit comes and goes according to his own dispensation. And if we do not remain very vigilant and so fail to observe this, then we will never experience desire for him in his absence, nor will we render due reverence to him and obey him when he's present. He said, if we have a facile bubbly optimism about our spiritual life so that we never experience the absence of God, we never experience the power of sin, then we be just become affectless. Sine affectione, astorgai, the word that St. Paul uses in the end of chapter 1 of Romans. We become without feeling, unable to determine whether the spirit's there or not. It's just business as usual. Uh, we crank out the old response and we think, you know, we don't think much about anything. He's saying, really, we need to learn to be attentive, to be, to be able to know what really comes from the Spirit and what doesn't come from the Spirit, what comes from our instincts and our own kinks and our pre-conscious uh, neuroses and all sorts of things like that. We must remain very vigilant because otherwise we will never experience desire for him in his absence, nor will we render due reverence to him and obey him when he's present. The Spirit leaves us from time to time in order that we may seek him more instantly. And how will this happen if we do not even notice his departure? So we're left in the lurch. God leaves us alone so that we can pursue him more. Well, if we're, we don't even know he's there, but we just sort of operate some silly ideas in the head, then we won't notice, we won't feel any change in ourselves. And all this is paralleled very strongly in, in the sermon number 74 on the Song of Songs, which we'll be looking at a little bit later, I think, um, 
uh, talking about the visitation of the word, the word visiting the soul, but the whole thing. He leaves us alone so that we may desire him, so that we may experience the effect to which we are sold under sin. He allows us to experience sin in our life so that we may cry out to him and, and need his mercy. And again, how can his majesty be worthily received when he comes to console if his present isn't detected? The mind which is ignorant of his departure is liable to be misled and being unmindful of his return will not give thanks for his visitation. We are thus taught and admonished by the prophet's example to be vigilant and careful with regard to the work of salvation which the Holy Spirit is ceaselessly accomplishing with all his remarkable subtlety and the sweetness of his divine skill in the depth of our being. In the depth of our being. Hear that? Not in our consciousness, but at a level which is substantially pre-conscious. The Holy Spirit dwells within us, God dwells within us, not in our consciousness, but at the level of being. And so we don't always determine, we don't always perceive his presence. It's not always. Being and consciousness don't correspond in this life. Let it never be said, let it never be that his masterly anointing by which he instructs us about everything is taken away from us without our being aware of the fact. In other words, he's moving on to the thing, he's saying, well, sometimes we are really led by the Spirit and we perceive the Spirit moving us and we can feel the action of grace. But sometimes we are left in the lurch. Everything disappears, the star goes out and we're left in the darkness. This is not God deserting us, but God submitting us to a different plan to help us to grow. Tonight, when you're get, get, getting into bed, count the number of legs you've got. Most of you will find you've got two. And so, to walk, you have two legs, right? One, two. A very complicated thing, walking. If you think about it, you'd never do it. Um, but you need two legs and walking has been defined as a, a sustained series of moments of imbalance because the strange thing is we can walk for hours and hours on end uh, without feeling all that tired but there is, isn't one moment of the stage of walking that we can keep for a few minutes but yet the whole process of walking on two legs now it's the same with this presence and absence, fear and hope there are two legs which carry us towards God. We can't possibly stand on one leg for very long. They say it's a torture used in some police states uh, because we can't stand on one leg. Eventually we fall. And it's the same thing whether it's fear or hope that we, uh, that we espouse, whether it's pessimism or optimism, then if we've only got one leg, we can't. Uh, if we try and lock into one single moment, we're doomed. But we need two legs to keep walking and we can go all the way to Mount Horeb. So, uh, we'll never be aware of the fact. If this is so, we shall be led astray regarding this adorable gift and on his return he will not find us unprepared. On the contrary, we shall wait for him with uplifted gaze and pounding hearts ready to receive the Lord's ample benediction. <coughs> Whom does the Lord seek? Surely it is those who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast. You don't know he's absent, you're not going to sit up and wait for him. And it is a fact that he never returns from those abundant delights of the heavenly banquet with empty hands. So there's a rhythm of absence and presence. Therefore, we must remain alert. Right, stay awake, he's saying to us, not only during the lectures, but also uh, with regard to, to our own spiritual state alert at all times, since we can never know in advance when the Spirit comes and when he goes. Now, this should be done in the letters of gold, and we should have a, an examination at the end that you know them off by heart. For it is a fact that the Spirit does come and go, first point, and that the one who stands with his support necessarily falls when this support is withdrawn. Necesse is the word he uses. He uses it in another context. It's necessary that he falls. The one who is only sustained by grace, when grace is removed, he plump. What they say in Australia, he comes a gutsa. 
which is the most gratifying thing that can happen to people you don't like, to see them come a gutsa, that they have stretched themselves, they've been prideful, they've been presumptuous, and they just bite off more than they can chew, and boom, down they go, they come a gutsa. Well, that's his saying, people who think that they can stand by themselves, who exult in their own strength, when the spirit, when grace is withdrawn, they fall. But the thing is, he's saying, it's necessary. And if it's necessary, it means it's not entirely to be traced to the vagaries of the human will, but is part of God's plan. This is where we're into advanced doctrine uh, here. For it is a fact that the spirit does come and go, and that one who stands with his support necessarily falls when this support is withdrawn but he does not collapse entirely, since the Lord once again uh, stretches out to him a helping hand. Now, in case you didn't hear that, we'll say it again. For people who are spiritual, or rather for those whom the Lord intends to make spiritual, this process of alternation goes on all the time. This is the means by which we grow in spirituality, by, uh, by falling on our face, and being picked up by the Lord. That's the means. This process of experience, presence and absence, falling and being raised up again, is absolutely central to the spiritual life. And what a sort of woe could you pronounce against a person who builds for himself structures that will keep him uh, from falling, so that he goes through life without falling, that's somehow artificially propped up. He's never going to experience the the, the joy of being lifted up again, when this is the way it goes. For people who are spiritual, or at least, or rather, for those whom the Lord intends to make spiritual, this process of alternation goes on all the time. God visits by morning and subjects to trial. The just man falls seven times, and seven times gets up again. What is important is that he falls during the day, and you remember the text says the just man falls seven times a day, and St. Bernard said, important thing that he falls during the day. Why is that? So that he sees himself falling. No use not knowing the difference. I mean, if you're really drunk, you don't know whether you're upright or downwards, or, or you're just on your face and you don't know whether you're walking or, or... So he's saying it's no good if you don't know that you've fallen, but you must know that you've fallen and feel that you've fallen, uh, he knows that he has fallen and wants to get up again and calls out for a helping hand, saying, O Lord, at your will you made me splendid in virtue, but then you turned away and I was overcome. It really is something that is quite worthwhile to, to reflect upon, to try and drive out all our Victorian moral standards, uh, the age Victorian, not the state, to drive out those things from our mind that it's not a question that, that, that he's talking about of, of prim respectability, but he's saying to recognize that if we don't allow ourselves to fall, uh, if, if there are other things that are preventing us from recognizing ourselves as fallen, then we're blind and we'll certainly never, never grow in any sense of prayerfulness, any sense of the relationship to God. Because prayer is born, and we'll see a text later on that says this quite explicitly, from the experience of our own need. Remember the quote I had from St. Augustine, because he is human, therefore he is needy. Because he is needy or, or weak, therefore he prays. That prayer comes from the experience of our own weakness. And if we've got some sort of kink in our system that uh, does not enable us to confront our weakness or tries to dress it up or to issue press releases to say, I've got it, but it's all underhand now, and it's really all right, I'm calling it by a different name, then, th then we'll never pray, we'll never make any growth. Bernard, in, 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 in the Apologia, also in Epistle number 1, about Robert, his cousin, you know, and, and frequently at other times, goes on with one of the big traps about monks' experience is that they, they, they get a dymo set. You, know? yeah. you call them dymo here, do you? These labels, these plastic labels. Mm. Dymo, is it? We go through life and we say uh, what everybody else would call vice and we put virtue on it. And he says that one of the big traps, you know, we talk too much and so we call that charity. 
and uh, we, we, we make a guts of ourselves whenever it comes to eat and we call that broad-mindedness and uh, we do something else and it's, we don't call things by their name but we relabel everything and then so we go through the room of all our behaviour and say look at all these wonderful virtues but they're not virtues, they're vices that I've deliberately put a false label on I've failed really to, to take stock and to really be honest about myself We'll come back on that one later on. But, but he's saying that really you'll never pray. If you say, oh, you know, I've got a, a, a room full of virtues, that's what my life is. No vices, I looked and I couldn't find any. Then I don't need God, I don't need to pray, I don't need help, I don't need to be saved, I'm all by myself. And that may be the way we want it for the time being, but it makes a charade of the whole, the whole uh, religious life and the whole uh, gospel of Christ. That it's absolutely necessary for us to experience ourselves as fallen. And if we don't experience ourselves as fallen and falling and <laughs> continuing to fall, then we will never have any interest in reaching out to God. This hasn't been recognized by very many people. One of those who did recognize it was uh, Pope John Paul I. Well, he didn't recognize much, but um, wasn't around long enough for that. But in, you might recall, his general audience of the 6th of September, 1978. Do you? No doubt. But he, th he makes this point exactly. I, make, I run the, si the risk of making a blunder. So he realises, you know, but he said this in the general audience. I, I run the risk of making a blunder, but I will say it. The Lord loves humility so much that sometimes he permits serious sins. Why? In order that those committing these sins may, after repenting, remain humble. And it's, 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 it's a gratifyingly clear statement of the thing, that God wants us to need him, God wants us to understand our own incapacity without him, and if the only way is to, let him, is to make us, uh, allow us to make a complete mess of our life, to do the thing which is most hateful to us, two, three, four years earlier, then uh, he will do it. And I've seen it happen a number of times, and it, it's interesting, uh, in other people at any rate, <laughs> it's interesting that it's just usually in the area in which they would least prefer it to happen. You know, somebody, you know, who, who, who is very uptight in, in areas of sexuality and, and doesn't even want to think about this thing and, and spent a lot of energy and time denying sexuality, well, it might be sexuality. Somebody who's invested an awful lot of effort in just being nice to people and being a good person in community and, and really, um, and, uh, you know, really kind and, and giving to other people will go through a scene in which he publicly is, is, denies all these values and causes very grave scandal. And, um, and, you know, it's very mysterious afterwards. The very central thing of, of, of um, a philosophy of life that people and perhaps the person himself thought was inviolable is suddenly just trampled down in the mud, often in a very, very public sort of way. And uh, I think when we know about this rhythm, we can sometimes help people who do that sort of thing, but almost any virtue that becomes, you know, people who you know, in 1978, uh, you know, really give themselves to prayer and love prayer and, and, and so forth. In 1982, suddenly realize that they haven't prayed for, for, for months <laughs> in a real sense, that they've completely forgotten prayer or one thing or the other. But it's, it's, we just better prepare ourselves for it. We, we don't know the area of our own fall, but if you want a little clue uh, for those who pay the supplement, um, we'll, we'll give it to you. Ask yourself, is there any area in which you would rather not make a mess of things? If you can find that, you've got it. <laughs> it's as simple as that. The very thing is, that, oh no, you know, not that. Not that. I, I just want to be on top of things in that area. You know, I've got rid of that or whatever it is, but, but that's the thing. And this is, this is, this is very, very sort of firm teaching of Bernard, that our spiritual advance, unless we're remarkably simple people, 
very rare, and certainly not many of them in monasteries. Um, this, is, this is the way we go through that type of dialectic. So we read me old mate Gregory the Great, one of the great Cistercian authors, uh, in the book of the Dialogues, book three, not many people go beyond book two, but book three, 1412, if you're interested in checking up to see if my translation's okay. That's uh, Source Cretian 260, page 312. The dispensation of Almighty God is large. It often happens that those to whom he grants the greater goods are denied the lesser. So, all right, they're, they're great saints and so forth, but he gives them some awful vice, uh, which maybe is even public. Denied the lesser, so that their minds might always have something with, with which to reproach themselves. Hence, although they long to be perfect, as we may, it's not possible for them. They work hard in the areas where they have not been given the gift and their labour achieves no result. So it's not a, uh, not a fact of going back on the deck chair and saying, you know, that's my problem, you know, poor me, you know, so I don't work on that one. He's saying they really want to overcome something. They work really hard. They're not just slackers. Uh, they work really hard but yet achieve no result. So they are less likely to have a high opinion of themselves in the areas in which they have been gifted. So we have areas of gifts, and, but there are some areas which God leaves undeveloped. Uh, leaves, there's a, there's a book we read in the refectory a few years ago, or well, many years, 20 years ago, by Bruno Scott James called Asking for Trouble. And uh, it's his autobiography, but he's got a great image there about uh, people, and himself in particular, lying fallow. That when God cultivates a field, um, part of the process of cultivation is to give it a rest for a while, <laughs> is to plant nothing in it, to let it lie fallow. And what happens when it lies fallow? Weeds grow up and all sorts of undesirable things. But the soil is resting and eventually the plough will go in again and you plough up the, the weeds and they'll become green manure and uh, the, 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 the <coughs> things will grow with greater energy than ever. But the period of lying fallow is very, very important because it enables us to draw the sort of uh, humility and other things and truth which will uh, keep our gifts and our assets in, in proper focus. Because they are not able to be victorious over small vices and excesses, they learn that the greater goods do not derive from themselves. I mean, you can't even overcome your envy. You can't even overcome your bad temper. You can't even overcome your lust. You can't even overcome your gluttony. And, and or you reckon all these high spiritual gifts come from you. So it's ridiculous to think that. If you, Even a simple thing like any of these vices, that anybody can, can overcome them. But you can't overcome them. And that shows that the gifts that you have are really not your own, but they come from God. <coughs>